I would like to jump right into it on why the two locations, because when, when, when all of this was happening before we, it was announced, it was either expected that it was going to be one location. Now we've got South Africa and Australia sharing the SKA. What do you think informed this decision? Well, both South Africa and Australia have put a lot of effort and money and time into their bids, into their preparation of their sites. Both have uh, been judged to have excellent sites, both of which could host the SKA. Um, it turns out that South Africa sort of won the recommendation, but in order to be inclusive and uh, make use of the existing infrastructure and all the work the Australians have put in and the money, um, it was thought that it is sort of scientifically justifiable and economically justifiable um, to have a split site solution which would keep Australia um, in the game, if you like, and as well as um, build the big array in Africa. So with the projections, I would imagine that the projections have now changed for if, if it was just South Africa that had gotten this particular project. So, so just in terms of, of revenue and what this means for South Africa, how much has that changed now that it's having to share this project with Australia? Well, as I said, there's already been a large sort of infrastructure investment in, in both countries. And uh, the sort of thinking from the, the groups that did, uh, did the decision making is that there's not a great additional cost uh, in order to include both the Pathfinder instruments, ASCAP in Australia and Meerkat in South Africa, into the first sort of phase of the SKA. It's sort of an incremental cost rather than a, a doubling of the cost. So it's not thought that there's going to be any um, significant increase in cost. Uh, due to the solution that's been proposed. So there are, the, there are other African countries that are mentioned as being involved in this project. In what capacity are they going to be involved? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. The other countries that are going to be, the other African countries that are going to be involved with this particular project, um, with South Africa hosting the telescopes that it will be hosting, what, in what capacity will they be involved in this project? All right, so, um, at the moment, there's sort of a large number of programs going on with those, with those other host countries. Ultimately, what would happen is that the far out stations of the SK in Africa, um, the South Africa and is, um, sort of has won the dish component of the system, if you like. And so arrays of uh, dishes, sort of stations of dishes, would be located in each of the um, African countries, all eight of them, um, which would then be sort of formed along baselines for the array. The long baselines give the high resolution uh, imaging capability to the ray. So uh, this would be a sort of an important infrastructure that's component that's added to each of those host countries. And in addition, there will be, um, of course, uh, technicians and things required to keep those components of the array working. And of course, all the fiber optic networks and such to um, move all the data back to a central correlator uh, uh, location. What I would like to ask you is we do have a broad idea of what the SK is going to do. From you, from, from a personal point of view, what is it that excites you about this project and what South Africa will be able to do? Oh, well, <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic project um, on many, many different fronts. Firstly, of course, there's the sort of cutting edge science and engineering side of it. Um, we're developing new technologies, new techniques that are required to build such an instrument of, of a vast scale as been, has, has been envisaged. Um, there are many important uh, opportunities in terms of sort of business development and research that flows from the project um, into possibly new businesses. There, there are great opportunities for young scientists and engineers uh, to get involved in the project. Um, there's opportunities on the sort of economic front in terms of operations of the array and the building of the array itself. Um, and of course, there's the, the most important thing, I guess, is the, the sheer sort of inspiration that astronomy can bring to people. When you look up at the night sky, there's a sort of sense of wonder. And to think that mankind has embarked on a global endeavor, a large part of which is sort of based in our country and in, in the neighboring countries, in order to explore the universe at a, at a scale, that, in a, at a level of detail that hasn't been able to be done before. I mean, that just opens people's uh, sort of their minds and imaginations. And really, I think, puts Africa on the map in terms of uh, what is possible in Africa. We haven't had a very large scientific instrument in, in Africa before. And so this is one of the first ones. And so this is a fantastic uh, uh, opportunity for Africa to showcase uh, what it can do and what kind of instruments it can host for the world. Jasper, um, if I think back, and this was a time when I was in high school and going to the planetarium, and it was such an amazing experience just uh, looking at, at some of these formations that are in the sky. I'd like to ask you, though, 
when it comes to what we'll be able to see, what the public will be able to see from what these telescopes pick up, how will that be translated to to what the public will be able then to see? Uh, just from a for the, from the for those of us that are not scientists, Jasper. All right. Okay. So the, the Hubble Space Telescope is an optical telescope, and I think most of the public is, is well aware of the Hubble. It produces these most magnificent sort of vistas of, of the heavens. Uh, a radio telescope does the same kind of thing as a telescope such as Hubble, but it looks at, at radio frequencies. It looks at light waves, but at a lower frequency. So you, you're exploring a part of the sky that you can't see with your eyes, you can't hear with your ears. We're not listening for sound. People often think that radio is somehow sound. Uh, we're actually looking at light, but at low frequencies. So what you can do with a big radio telescope is in fact make a, an image of the sky very similar to something that Hubble would produce, but showing features that aren't uh, visible to the, to the optical telescopes such as Hubble. So for example, you can look through dust clouds, um, you can get ideas of uh, uh, gas that surrounds galaxies and, and how the galaxies are rotating and how the gas is helping to form those galaxies. Um, you can really create some very stunning visual pictures of what's there. In addition to that, there's a kind of more geeky scientific way of, of looking at the, the results from the telescope. So some of the experiments, important experiments on these um, early telescopes and, and on the SKA, on the precursors and on the SKA, involve, for example, looking at pulsar timing arrays. Now, Pulsar is a spinning neutron star about oh. the size of a city. Oh, Jasper, um, that's, good. That's, good. that's getting a little bit complicated. But thank you so much. We have run out of time for this particular interview. Thank you so much. I just love how you lit up when we started talking about what your excitement about the SKA is coming to South Africa. Thank you so much, Jasper.